Well, I was just uh, going back over, you did a debate a few years ago with Carrie Baldwin. Oh, yeah, I remember her. Uh, yeah, Carrie Baldwin, a nice young lady, and she and I had an amiable discussion on um, evictionism, abortion. We didn't agree, uh, uh, but you can't win them all. Have you kept up with her? Did, had you met her before, know anything about her, or was that a very impromptu debate? That was a, a one time. Uh, I, I was hoping to convert her by uh, sending her some of my publications, but she never responded. Oh, that's unfortunate. I sort of lost touch with her. Well, there was one thing um, that we touched on the last time we spoke about, a, I guess, gosh, two and a half, a little over two and a half years ago, maybe almost three years ago now. Um, we're getting into the self-ownership thing. Like, you know, it. God, I think God's a self-owner, but then we have derivative rights from him. And then versus the self-ownership view. And I really felt like that was the main thing behind the whole abortion evictionism thing. She had one really interesting quote. Um, she said, if all fetuses are trespassers and all women who choose not to evict are acting altruistically, then human rights are contingent, not absolute, grounded in the voluntary altruism of another and not in self-ownership. And I think that's basically the summation of my view, which is like, we, we came from God. And so he, uh, our rights are contingent on him, on somebody else, which, I mean, every, anybody who's born is, their their existence is contingent on their parents. And so at some level, like that's true for everybody, whether your view is the same as your parents or not, your view, your existence is dependent on somebody else's action. Well, I, I think, first of all, I'm an atheist, so I... I um... Uh, have a difficult time grappling with the idea of God. Uh, I, uh, I, I mean, I respect people who believe that, but I just don't happen to. Um, my view of libertarianism is not so much the relationship of man and God, but the relationship of each other with each other. And the way I see it, the fetus has rights, even though um, uh, uh, the fetus is dependent upon the goodwill of the mother. I mean, if the mother um, uh, evicts the fetus uh, before the seventh month, the fetus is not uh, fully developed enough in order to survive outside of her body. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, she wants to evict or abort in the eighth month when the baby is viable outside the womb, I say she has no right to do that. She has a right to evict but not to abort, because abort means uh, evicting plus killing. And uh, she has certainly a right to evict. It's her body. She owns her body. And, and the baby is a trespasser if it's unwanted. Or I shouldn't say it. I should say if he is unwanted, uh, then uh, uh, the mother has a right to evict him, but not to kill him. And um, there are cases where uh, the, the way that they evict is, is they cut off the baby's head uh, horribly, whereas they could have just pulled the baby out by the head or by the feet or however they do it in a gentle manner possible, uh, in the gentlest manner possible, and then the baby would have survived. And I think the mother is obliged to do that, and if she doesn't do it, she's a criminal. And the doctor who helps her is aiding and abetting criminality, and they both should go to jail because uh, th this is a pretty heinous crime. It it's murder of a human being. And I, I uh, think that the human being starts with the fertilized egg, not with birth. I mean, some people say that um, a birth is when you become a human being. But, you know, the difference between a baby one hour before and one hour after birth, it, there's no difference. It's like you and I an hour ago and an hour from now, we're, we're roughly the same people. And um, uh, so I, I think it starts with the fertilized egg. In the Jewish tradition, uh, life doesn't begin until you graduate medical school, but that, that's just being <laughs> silly. Uh, actually, there is a Jewish tradition, and, and that is uh, the baby doesn't start until there's a heartbeat, uh, becoming a human. But I don't think that's sensible either. Look, suppose I have a, a heart transplant, and they take my heart out, so for a half hour, I've got no heart. I've got no heartbeat, so I'm not alive. No, I'm about to receive another heart from somebody else, and I'll, I'll have a heartbeat. 
So I, I think heartbeat is irrelevant with all due respect to the Talmud. I, I am a libertarian uh, more than I am a Jew. I'm Jewish by birth, but not by belief. Uh, although I think the Talmud uh, is wise and, and informative in many ways, but not on this one. So my view is evictionism is the only proper legal system where uh, the, it's as if the mother has a house, only it's her body. And if somebody comes into her house without um, uh, permission, they're a trespasser and, and she has a right to say, you know, go away. Uh, and and I think the baby is a trespasser. Now you might say, well, uh, what about voluntary sexual intercourse? Uh, did she not invite the baby in? And, and if you invite someone, don't you have an obligation to keep them in there for nine months? Well, first of all, uh, take the case of rape. Uh, there was no invitation. And now all of a sudden, there's a baby growing inside the woman that she certainly didn't invite. And all babies have the equal rights. Uh, the ones who are product of rape and the ones who are product of voluntary sexual intercourse. So uh, certainly uh, the, the baby who is a product of rape is, if that baby is not a trespasser, there's no such thing as trespassing. That baby is certainly a trespasser. And yet the baby is innocent. The father is, is a rapist, but the baby is innocent and, and has all the rights of any other baby. And secondly, uh, for there to be an invitation, there has to be an invitor and an invitee. You just can't invite uh, somebody who doesn't exist. And yet at the time of intercourse, there is not yet a fertilized egg. It takes a while for the sperm to get up through the tubes to hit the egg, and, and then there's a baby. So just because you have voluntary sexual intercourse doesn't mean you've invited anyone. Now, there is one exception, and that is the host mother. Uh, say me and my wife are infertile or somehow we can't have a baby and we hire a woman and we give her my sperm. Uh, and uh, now we pay her $50,000 or whatever it is. And we say your job is for the next months to uh, next nine months to, you know, um, <laughs> uh, keep the baby going. She has no right to evict. Certainly not to abort but not even to evict because she's contractually obligated not to do that. But with that one exception, uh, people are able to uh, uh, have a right to evict. Now, the, the problem comes, suppose you want to evict in, in the third month of pregnancy. Well, now that baby is going to die. And, and this is not nice. And I don't like it. And I, I think uh, women should be nice and keep all babies going because every life is precious. But, she has a right to do it. She has a right to evict even though the baby will die. So, so evictionism is a true compromise between pro-life and pro-choice. Pro-life says she has no right to evict at any time and certainly no right to kill. Uh, sorry, that's pro-life. Pro-choice says she has a right to evict and to kill. And what, what I'm saying as an evictionist is she has one of these rights but not both. So it's a, it's a true principled compromise. Uh, what do I mean by a principle compromise? I say two plus two is six. You say two plus two is four. So we compromise and we say two plus two is five. We sort of cut the baby in half kind of a thing. Um, but that's a compromise, but it's not a principled one because you can't deduce that two plus two equals five from anything. It's just false. But this is a principle compromise. Uh, it happens to be a compromise between pro-life and pro-choice but it's very principled in the sense that it is uh, deducible from principles of private property rights. The woman is the owner of her house, her body. And if I own a house or a car, I have a right to say who stays in and who, who doesn't. What would you say? I thought about this example. Um, if a man was, let's say somebody attacked him and like seriously injured him and he's in critical condition and left him on somebody else's property and then the paramedics get there and they say, he's in such critical condition, we need to treat him right here. If we move him, he's very likely to die. Now, as the owner of the property, would the, would the owner be able to say, I don't care, move him anyway? Without like, in what situation would he be able to say that without any kind of legal consequences? That's a very tough, nasty question, and I hate you for asking. No, <laughs> that, that's a very, very important question. Um, 
the way I would deal with that is if I understand the question correctly, and I've heard it before of versions thereof, so I, I think I'm vaguely, at least vaguely familiar with it. Property rights are sacrosanct. Uh, in this case, th that guy is going to die. But more people will live if we respect private property rights than if we reject private property rights in these weird examples. Sure. Another one would be, um, uh, I drug you, and then I stole you away on an airplane. And now you're at 30,000 feet and the owner of the airplane doesn't want you there. And he regards you as a trespasser. And uh, does he have a right to toss you out? Yes. Even though it's pretty nasty. And I'm, a, I'm the murderer. He's not the murderer. And uh, when, when you um, beat up this guy and left him on my property, um, you're the bad guy. Right. I, now, it'd be nice if I said, OK, look, the guy, uh, uh, he's a trespasser, but, but, you know, we can't move him until the medics do their thing. And I want to save his life. Uh, that would be virtuous. But strictly speaking, and I admit that this sounds horrible. Uh, strictly speaking, I have a right to say, you know, um, I want him off my property right now. Even though he's going to die. I mean, I'm, I'm um, what's the word, uh, acquainted with how horrible that sounds. I mean, it really sounds nasty. But if we want to be logically consistent and we want to deduce from private property rights, that's the implication. Now, in a practical sense, once word gets out that that property owner said that, nobody's going to be his friend. And people are going to boycott him. And he probably won't do it. But if he's a real curmudgeon and a real nasty guy, he should be able to do that if we're going to uphold pri private property rights fully. And I say that if we don't, then the only people who are going to die are these hypothetical weirdo cases where uh, they're stowing on an airplane and, and uh, the guy is on my property after you uh, punched him out or, or whatever it was. Uh, whereas if we give up on private property rights, many, many people will die. So I'm fully cognizant of the fact that my answer sounds horrendous. But if we look at it more carefully, we will see that if you go with private property rights, billions, not millions of people's lives will be saved. One of my favorite examples of this is um, in the Soviet Union, um, what was it, 90 Seven percent of the farmland was uh, collectivized, owner, uh, non-owned uh, by private property, and three percent was um, owned privately, namely the front yard or the backyard or the workers. And on the ninety-seven percent of the land, they produced seventy-five percent of the crops. And on the three percent of the land, they produced twenty-five percent of the crops. Well, if you don't want to have starvation, you have to have private property rights. And if you're going to have private property rights, you have to defend private property rights, even in cases where uh, critics come up with weird cases, like my example of the airplane or your example of punching out this innocent guy, and now he's on my property. So that, that's the way I would try to wrestle with that very important um, uh, uh, challenge that you offer. I love your, your consistency with it, and I think I actually agree with you in, in how consistent you are. Um, the well they say consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds <laughs> but um well, that's i guess you have a quote. little mind that's an interesting quote um the biggest thing so let's say um well the reason that i asked one way the way that i asked the question was in what situation would that be allowable and you say every and i can think of somewhere i would say well let's say he landed on top of let's say somebody else's life support that if he didn't get this stranger that was laying, let's say he landed in his house or something or like I'm, I'm, I know this is going into like a, a, a freak accident of a freak accident situation. Um, but if it was something else that was critical enough to where he literally had to decide between somebody else dying that he knows maybe a family member of his and this other person, I think it would be his duty to, to choose his own family member. Um, and so it, but then if you do it in that situation, I would say just the same way as you, if at all possible, I would, anybody that I would want to be my friend to say, yes, I would, of course I would want to save their life because, and then this goes back to a, another base, base question. 
is um, you mentioned uh, early on in the debate um, the the difference between uh, a legal something that's legally required versus something that's morally required. And there's a difference in distinction. I don't necessarily have that. Um, but I understand for the libertarian perspective, I can't put words in your mouth and say that, Oh, that, um, in this sense, you'd be perfectly fine with somebody doing something possibly immoral, but also perfectly legal. Is that, is that right? Well, yeah, I, I guess I regard, I, I don't know. Um, uh, getting drunk is immoral. You're hurting yourself. The, the brain synapses are weakened, and, and you know it's no good for your liver. And you know, getting drunk is not not cool. But should you go to jail for getting drunk and and hurting your body? Uh, no, not as a libertarian. But look, t- take ultra marathoners i'm not talking about marathon or running a, a stinking lousy 26 miles i'm you know they run 100 miles you run 100 miles you're gonna mess up your body your your knees your, you know your your spine maybe it's immoral i'm not sure i'm not really up on what's moral and what's not but a case could be made that you're being immoral so should we forbid ultra marathon that's crazy you know i wanted uh, since you have this um predilection to come up with weird cases that embarrass libertarianism i want to give you one yes my please. favorite one is the martians the martians are evil and, and all powerful and what they say is that unless we kill the next person that walks in the room or past the on the street they'll blow up the whole world and that guy will die also so what should we do I mean, they're all powerful and they're really nasty. They make Hamas look like uh, kindergarten, uh, you know. Uh, they're, they're very, very bad. And um, what I would do is immorally, I personally would kill that guy. Because I want to save the whole world. I have children. I have grandchildren. I don't want them all to die. I don't want the whole world to die. I would kill the guy. And it's certainly immoral. to <laughs> Murder is a very bad thing. But here I'm murdering in order to save the lives of the whole planet. I mean, they'll blow up the whole planet. They'll, they'll be just asteroids or sort of like the Mar- the belt between Mars and um, Jupiter. That'll be the Earth. There'll be nobody alive on the planet. So I'm, I'm going to kill them. Now, this is an embarrassment for libertarianism because one of the essences of libertarianism is that murder, rape, theft, kidnapping are illegal. But it, it doesn't just say that it's illegal. It says it should be punishable. So if you murder someone, we're going to punish you. And I'm a big fan of the death penalty for murderers. Uh, 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 My proof of this is um, uh, if if I murder you, what did I do to you? I stole your life. If I stole your car, what's the first thing that should happen? I should return your car. Well, if I kill you, I stole your life. And now we have a machine based on Robert Nozick. Uh, example, which will transfer the life out of my live body into your dead body. Should we do it? Of course we should do it. Because I stole your life, and now we're returning a life, namely my life, my life force into you. And uh, your dead body and my live body go into the machine. We flip the switch. And now I come out as a dead body, and you come out as a live person. Is this just? Of course this is just. So what should happen is that I murder the next guy who is um, crosses the street or whatever it is, and then you execute me. But then those lousy, rotten Martians, you know what they do? They say that if you follow libertarian principles and execute me, then they'll blow up the world. Do, do you see what a powerful, uh, do you see that this is a critique of libertarianism first? And then do you see how convoluted and weird you have to go in order to uh, undermine libertarianism? Namely, libertarianism is pretty strong. Right. Yes, it's vulnerable to these weird Martian cases, which are interesting. And, you know, I wish I could think of a way out of them. I can't. I would just say, okay, well, I'm not a libertarian. Uh, so we, we, we should, I'm going to kill somebody and, and you guys shouldn't execute me. So I'm not a libertarian, you know, sue me. Uh, because I, I favor all the <laughs> life of everybody on the planet more than libertarianism. So I'm, I'm just a moderate. 
That's why I'm, I'm known far and wide, at least in my own mind, as Walter Moderate Block, because there are cases where I'm willing to give up libertarianism. But you have to push hard. You have to come up with Martians who are evil and intent on uh, undermining libertarianism. But apart from that, I'm pretty much a solid libertarian. Yeah, it's uh, I think as far as libertarianism goes, it's right. But as you said, it only goes so far. It doesn't go to the point of, okay, it, what about you, you get drunk in your own house and nobody knows it between, b besides you and your maker? Who, how, do you, how do you punish somebody for that? And I would agree that you, you can't. The person is just going to suffer the consequences of what he did to himself. He can't escape that unless he figures out some kind of magical way for it to have all of the benefits of being drunk and none of the side effects, in which case I would say, like, go listen to music or something else. As Dennis Prager says, music is God's drug uh, or something like that. But th there's a certain point where you can do something that doesn't affect anybody else, but you just can't escape the consequences yourself. Why should you punish the guy who gets drunk alone? I mean, he didn't commit any crime. He didn't violate anyone's rights. I don't think you should punish him. I mean, reality will punish him. Right. He's going to have a stomach ache and he's going to, you know, tomorrow morning he's going to be throwing up or whatever. And he's going to hurt his health. And that's punishment, but it's not really punishment because he didn't commit a crime. It's just uh, there are negative repercussions to uh, doing harmful things to yourself. Yeah. So how did you come to this position of evictionism? Did it, was it something that you had an epiphany and woke up one morning or is it something you gradually came to and how long ago was it? You know, I don't remember for sure. I, what I'd have to do is go look at my CV and see when my first article was published on this. And I would expect it was in the 1970s, but I'm not sure I, I could, I could look it up. Um, how did I come to it again? I don't remember for sure, but my now my thoughts on it are, I revere two people, Murray Rothbard and Ron Paul. Uh, they're the leaders of the libertarian movement, and I'm the acolyte or the mentee of both of them. I, I was fortunate enough to know Murray and be his friend uh, during his life, and I claim friendship with Ron Paul, and I admire both of them to distraction. And yet, one of them is pro-life. Ron Paul, and the other is pro-choice, Murray Rothbard. And yet they start from the same principles and they deduce in, into 180 degrees opposite um, uh, conclusions. And this is not kosher. Uh, this is not cool. We got to do something about this. Uh, and I concocted evictionism, which takes half a loaf from each and, and says that both of my mentors are wrong. Ron Paul is wrong because the pro-life position is wrong. Murray Rothbard is wrong because the pro-choice position is wrong. And the only correct view is evictionism. And I think that might have been part of the impetus for this. Um, I, I do a lot of that stuff when, when there's a debate, uh, intra-libertarian debate, whether it's abortion or immigration or a voluntary slavery. Uh, there are debates within the libertarian movement, and I uh, have a predilection to get involved in them because I don't like libertarians debating with each other. We, we all start from the same principles, non-aggression and private property rights based on homesteading, and that's pretty much it. And, and we should all come to the same conclusions uh, using logic. And if we come to different conclusions, one or the other or both are wrong. And uh, in this case, I think uh, both are wrong. So that might have been my inception, but I, I'm, I'm getting old and senile, so I, I can't remember <laughs> just how did I come up with this, but that's the best way I can answer the question now. What would you say, um, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've heard this, the, the idea of you reap what you sow. Is that something that, I mentioned this at the very beginning, if somebody is, wants to evict because private property rights are sacrosanct and they just want to take advantage of that. Um, should he be surprised if then he's put in a similar situation and somebody 
opts to do the same to him that he had done to somebody else. Would that be, how, how does that make you feel that thought? Yeah. Well, what goes around comes around um, another aphorism. And, and I, I think that's true, but this idea that if you made your bed, lie in it, or you shall uh, reap what you sow, S O W. I think that's wrong. I mean, I'm a drunkard. I'm not really, but let's say I'm a drunkard and I booze it up. And then um, I go to you, a doctor, and you cure me. So I don't have to reap what I've sown uh, because you, you're a great doctor and, and you cured me. I don't have to lie in the bed that I've made. I, I made a mess of my life, but now you're my psychiatrist and, and you cure me. And uh, so I for free, I don't... For free or for pay? Well, uh, who knows? I mean, if you're my friend, you might do it for free, or if you're a therapist or a doctor, you might help me. But the point is, I don't have to reap what I sow. Another biblical uh, one that I don't really like is, uh, what's it called? The golden rule? Yeah, the golden rule is basically what I was asking about. Which is the golden rule? Um, as you as you treat others, uh, well, uh, treat others as you'd want to be treated. Right. The problem with that is masochism. I'm a masochist. I want you to hit me. I want you to punch me in the nose because I'm a masochist. So I can now treat you the way I want you to treat me. I can punch you in the nose. Huh? No. <laughs> I shouldn't be able to punch you in the nose just because I want you to punch me in the nose. So I think the golden rule fails. And I substitute for it the libertarian non-aggression principle and private property rights based on homesteading. I think that's a much better way of uh, dealing with each other than the golden rule. Now, I wish uh, the, um, what do you call it, the um, golden rule worked, because it really sounds nice, and, and there's a lot of biblical precedent for it. But I, I don't know how you get around the masochism objection. Well, wouldn't boxing basically be a form of that? Well... You, you, you agree to hit somebody else, and they agree to hit you back, and whoever... Whoever right. wins wins. Yeah, but but it's not a it's not a basic principle like the libertarian principles. Yes, yeah, so we're in a boxing ring and and we agree to punch above the belt. And you know if you hit below the belt, you apologize for it. You get a point taken off or whatever it is. Um, so there, the golden rule works. The golden rule works in most cases. The only case where it doesn't work is sure. Mexico. Yeah, we're we're throwing extreme examples back and forth, which is right. which is good. I think that's how you test things until they break. Right. Destructive yeah. testing, as they call it. But I, I but I shouldn't be such a braggart in behalf of libertarianism. But we've we've also come up with a case where libertarianism doesn't work, namely the Martians. Right. So now we come up with a case where the golden rule doesn't work, masochists. But there are masochists, and there are no Martians, <laughs> as far as I know. Uh, hopefully when we get to Mars, we won't find little green men who can pulverize us. Well, and I think the difference, the reason that the, I would say the golden rule does work is because it's not a, it's not a statement of fact. It's a direction that, that we're given say you should act this way. Obviously a lots of people don't, lots of people don't treat other people the way they'd want to be. And that's, and that's a problem with them. No, I think it's it's a very good rule for 99% of all human action because people want to be treated decently and the world would be a much better place if we all treated each other decently. Yeah, I think uh, deep down, I think everybody's a libertarian, but <laughs> whether they say it out loud or not, but when it comes to how they want to be treated, I think most people want to be treated like they have full rights over their affairs. Well, I, I wish that everyone was really a libertarian, but my experience is, I don't know, we, we have welfare system, we have minimum wage, we have taxes, we, we have a lot of things that are... Well, of course, you want to treat everybody else the, the way that you benefit disproportionately to, to them. But I think as, as soon as it comes to somebody now has to decide if somebody else got to choose how you acted towards me, everybody, I think would basically always choose to be treated like a libertarian, even if they don't treat others that way. Well, here's another aphorism from your mouth to God's ear. May God, if he exists, convert everyone to libertarianism. <laughs> oh, I have another one. Uh, if you're not a libertarian, you're not going to heaven. Okay. So, okay. so uh, everyone should become a libertarian if they want to get into heaven. At least consistently, because I think people can still get into heaven, even, even if they're not uh, perfectly consistent, but at least... 
at least they have a heart to try to be as consistent as they can yeah, be. Yeah, we're all imperfect, but you know, if we try and, and we mostly succeed, which is not the world that I know of, the world that I know is unfortunately not as libertarian as it should be. I can definitely agree with that. Well, we'll if wrap it, it were, up there. If it were, Ron Paul would have been president and Rand Paul would be the next president and uh, neither Trump nor Biden would be president. What's the what's the libertarian slogan? Um, plotting to take over the world and leave you alone. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, maybe this guy in Argentina will become uh, president. Uh, Javier Milie, Milieu. Uh, not sure how to pronounce his name. Uh, he, he looks pretty good, and he might become president of Argentina. So. And wasn't there? There was another country that adopted, I think, Bitcoin as like the legal tender. Um. I think it was like Guam or, or something. It was one of the United States territories, I think. Yeah, there, there are attempts. Uh, there's a thing called Liberland, a new country in the middle of Europe near Monaco somewhere, which is libertarian. So there's hope. There is hope. Well, thanks for having me on your show again. I always enjoy it. And, and let not three years go by before we get together again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll talk to you again soon.